Okay. <laughs> Liveness is coming up on Wednesday. We still have one more Spinoza lecture in which I have to fit in basically like everything I didn't get to last time and most important stuff in the book. So I'll see what, <laughs> see what I can do. All right. So uh, like what I didn't, what I was just starting to get to last time was the idea of a false or inadequate idea. The idea of, I, didn't, I shouldn't say the idea of, but I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, of inadequate or false ideas also, also calls them fragmentary. Fragmentary and confused. Maybe these are two different things, but they go together anyway. Um, right, and like you might think false and in inadequate are different because inadequate. I mean, and and again, this is like one of the surprises that he sets up at the beginning of uh, beginning of. Part two, I think, where, uh, where's the beginning of part? <laughs> the beginning of part two, yeah, where where he says defines an inadequate idea, an adequate idea as an idea that has everything intrinsic that's needed for truth, but not the extrinsic thing that's needed for truth, namely correspondence to the object. Right, so similarly, you might think false and inadequate ideas are different. Like an inadequate idea is an idea that's not even suitable to be true, but a false idea is an idea that, although it, it, it's adequate, it, it still doesn't correspond to its object. However, we know that as part two goes on, uh, Spinoza proves that every adequate idea is true. So false and inadequate are actually the same thing. Right. That is the only way an idea can fail to correspond to its object is if there's something intrinsically wrong with the idea. But then, of course, it turns out to be even weirder than that because there can't really be something intrinsically wrong with the idea. Because uh, every idea in the divine intellect is adequate. And there aren't any ideas outside the divine intellect. That's Proposition 15 of Part 1, right? Everything that exists is in God and cannot be conceived except in God. So, uh, so all ideas are adequate and all ideas are true. Um, so it turns out that a false or inadequate idea is an idea can be false or inadequate only as referred to a finite mind. Right, so the difference, the distinction between a true and adequate idea and a false and inadequate idea is a, is a difference in between which mind you're relating it to which mind you're considering it as, as being in. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, um, so how does this work? What makes an idea false or inadequate as referred to a certain mind? Um, well, so, um, basically every finite idea, like considered just in itself is completely inadequate. Not even suitable to be true. Um, it, uh, so why is that? So it, that is, it's going to turn out that the hard thing to understand is how finite minds can have adequate ideas. 
you might it, it starts to look at a certain point like any idea in a finite mind would be inadequate. So why is that? Well, um, um, so an idea is in a mind. So like, this is the divine intellect. The divine intellect, remember, is an infinite mode of the attribute of thought. There's supposed to be other infinite, infinite modes of the attribute of thought. Although, as I was saying towards the end last time, it, it's not clear exactly what they are. Because a lot of the things you might have thought were, were other modes, and he even used the examples as examples of other modes earlier on, turn out to just be intellect back again. So I'm not sure what thought contains other than the intellect, but anyway, the intellect is the uh, the mode of the attribute of thought that contains ideas. So minds are ideas, right? Like for example, a human mind is the idea of a, a, a particular human mind is the idea of a particular human body. Minds are ideas. How can ideas be in minds? Well, so this is where, I mean, there's something weird that I don't quite understand. Um, well, many things I don't quite understand, but there's something I don't quite understand about this following from relation. So some ideas follow from other ideas. And similarly, some modes of extension follow from other modes of extension. And the two sequences are completely parallel, right? That was proposition seven of part two. Um, but forgetting about the modes of extension now, just concentrating on ideas, some ideas follow from other ideas. This is a quasi-logical relation. I mean, it is a logical relation, but the logic is not exactly normal logic. <laughs> it's more like Hegelian logic. So anyway, um, so to be in an I to be in a mind, for an idea to be in a mind, the idea has to follow from that mind. Um, but there's something I don't understand in general about difference between um, so here's two relationships the relationship between cause and effect and the relation between I guess you would say subject and mode yeah subject here doesn't mean substance there's only one substance Right, but nevertheless, the finite modes themselves have modes or act or you know characteristics, properties, whatever. Right, um, right. So, for example, a finite body has a shape and a size and whatever. And so, similarly, um, a mind has ideas in it, and those are modes. Those are modes of thought that are in that mind. Right. This is the same thing Descartes said about ideas. Their modes of thought. But on the other hand, the, so what makes them modes? Well, they, they can't be conceived with, or they can't be adequately conceived without the mind that they're in. They follow from it. And so you can't know what they are without knowing the mind that they follow from. But the same is also true of effects. And maybe these are a kind of effect, but it, but but it's important, and it's important to understanding everything that's going to happen after this. That there's a difference between the kind of effect that is outside of its cause and can, and in a certain sense, must exist after its cause, not simultaneously with it, as opposed to the kind of effect that's in its cause. <laughs> or that's a mode of its cause or something like that. Um, 
So I don't know exactly how to explain that difference. But it's important if we look down, right? So this is thought down here is extension. Also, is there a difference that parallels the difference between intellect and other modes in the realm of extension? What would that be? Um, anyway, <laughs> so if we look down here in the realm of extension, it's going to be important. Well, maybe I should draw a human body here. Here's a human body. So let's say this mind is the idea of this human body. Now, um, when another body affects this, it's, um, it causes something here. The thing it causes is an effect of this body, but it's a mode of this body. It, this is what Descartes calls the image. I mean, Spinoza calls the image. Um, so, like, this is going to be, and something parallel happens up here. That is, the mind of this body has an effect on this mind. Somehow. <laughs> the mind, so, when this, when, when this, like, ball hits me in the stomach, the mind of the ball <laughs> hits my mind, <laughs> and um, um, and it leaves it. The ball hitting me leaves an impression in my body, and therefore it leaves an idea in my mind. That is, its mind leaves an idea in my mind, right? Because again, the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. In this case, the things being the modes of extension. Um, and right, and I mean, this is why I feel something when the when I say the ball hits me. I first I, what I should say is the ball hits this body. Right, so the ball hits my body, the body that my mind is an idea of, um, and I feel it. Why do I feel it? Because this happens. Is that clear? Some people are frowning. Yeah. So is it like kind of like uh, like the perception of being hit by the ball? Because the ball, because the mind of the ball is hitting your mind. That's why you're feeling the ball because your mind is like. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, of course, the mind of the ball doesn't hit your mind. That's not like I don't, I don't know exactly how to understand what happens here, but, 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 but he, you know, but he says things happen in the mind only because of other thoughts, in right, other ideas in the divine intellect. That's all that can affect my mind. So, you know, yeah, so somehow the mind of this, this ball or, you know, or the mind of its parts or something like um, has consequences. Um, and some of the consequences are in my mind. And um, uh, the, the consequences in my mind are so the consequence of, of this in my mind is an idea, which is an idea of this bodily effect. The thing that Spinoza calls the image, right? So that so when the ball causes, right, he defines image as something that happens to the body. This is different from the way Descartes defines image. So they, so the so when the ball causes an image in my mind, there's an idea of the sorry causes an image in my body. There's an idea of the image in my mind, which was caused by the mind of the ball. Something. Okay, so far so good. 
Now, <laughs> I guess so far so good. Um, but now let's ask, um, is this idea adequate in my mind? And the answer is um, that it isn't because although it can't be conceived without my mind, and that's what makes it a mode of my mind, it also can't be conceived without the mind of the ball. And that's what makes it an effect of the mind of the ball. So again, I like I don't know exactly how to understand why there's two different things that happen here. <laughs> but um uh but so the result of the ball hitting me is that um I have an idea of this image. Um, it's in my mind. It can't be conceived without my mind, but it can't be fully conceived just with my mind. You also need something else that's outside my mind, namely its cause. And of course, um, you know, something caused the ball to do this. Something caused the ball's mind to do this, and so on and so on, ad infinitum. So, um, the divine intellect contains all of these, contains this whole chain. So in the divine intellect it also contains my mind. So in the divine intellect, everything you need to conceive this, this image um, is there. But most but all of this stuff is not in my mind. And therefore, considered as a mode of my mind, this idea is fragmentary, that's why he calls it fragmentary. It's like missing something. It's confused. Confused means like you can't tell the difference between it and other ideas. How is that possible? Because like, again, you can look at this as a process of kind of like deduction. When you think of the idea as something that's true, right? But if when you think of it as, um, a function of the will, affirming, right? Then you can think of this as the deduction. Because God affirms this, God affirms this. Why does God affirm this? Because of this, because of this, because of this, right? Um, uh, but you could also think of it as a process of definition, right? When you think of it as like um, a function of the understanding, like knowing what this is, how does God know what this is? Well, only by um, by relating it back to this and this. Um, so, so it's both like fragmentary, and Spinoza says it's like a conclusion without the premises. I think it's not just like like a conclusion without the premises. It is a conclusion without the premises. Yeah. Um, so is it like we can like we can understand the ball hitting us, but because every because all the other stuff is in the divine intellect, we can't understand the cause of it hitting us. Well, but without understanding the cause of it hitting us, we don't we um neither are justified in affirming it, right? That is, we don't have the premises that would justify the affirmation nor do we know exactly what it is we're affirming. So then because we don't we know the law hits us. Well, uh, we don't have a perfect idea of well, well, I mean, first of all, yeah, we don't know, right? Because we might be dreaming, <laughs> as right, Spinoza keeps mentioning. Um, and, you know, uh, after they fart, how could you not? Um, so we don't know. But even if the ball did hit my body, uh, like I don't, um, 
know enough about that event to tell the difference between that and other possible events. Right, so what I have is a, um, I have kind of like a blurry, it's both regarded as a judgment, it's unjustified, and therefore I may believe it at times when it's false. Um, regarded as a concept, it's, in, it's uh, not fully defined, and therefore I may confuse it with other similar concepts. Um, um, and I, uh, this is how we start thinking that like bodies are interchangeable, that they could have, you know, that it could have been this way instead of that, or that a whole bunch of bodies are belong to the same lowest species, that they all are exactly the same kind of thing or whatever, right? That's all because of this. So, right, when I, when I have an idea of this kind, this is imagination, the ideas of images. And when we use, when we um, know the world by way of our senses and imagination, which are basically the same thing, as you can see there, um, we know it in this confused um, and not fully justified way. Even though this idea is the very same idea by which God knows the definite and, and necessary truth. <laughs> Yeah. So he's essentially saying like truth is relational, right? Like any idea is true given the right relationship to other things. And God contains infinite things and infinite relationships. So anything is true in there. But only some of those relationships are in me. So like the truth of an idea isn't in the idea. It's in its relationship to other stuff in God. Right, so that's that's why I said to begin with, every finite idea considered by itself is wholly inadequate yeah. and false, right? It's missing an infinite number of premises. Did you have a question? I guess not, no. Okay. Um, um, So, like, anyway, what did I want to say on this? I mean, a different order than I can do, but that's a okay. <laughs> Um. Right, so like the explanation of how I go wrong. Um, right, so remember, Descartes says I go wrong because I um, I have an idea. Um, uh, I don't have the um, I don't have the guidance of reason as to whether I should affirm it or not, but I still have free will, and therefore I can affirm it or reject it um, with no on uh, no reasonable grounds, and that's how I fall into error. That's Descartes, right? But of course, Spinoza wants to say. Um, the opposite. I can't have the idea without affirming it. <laughs> Intellect and will are one and the same. Um, So why do I go wrong? Um, like, is it my fault somehow? Well, um, not in any obvious sense of fault. I mean, he's gonna 
like in book five, he's he's going to try to explain something that looks like virtue and um, vice and whatever, but um, but just looking at it from this point of view, what is it that happens? Well, um, this this idea necessarily follows from these two ideas. It has to come. Just as this necessarily follows from the laws of mechanics. Um, and I can't have the idea without affirming it. Um, so I must make this judgment. My mind contains this judgment. Um, even though I don't know the conditions under which it would be correct. The conditions under which it is correct for God, right? I don't know them, but nevertheless, I must make the judgment. Um, and um, it has to be that way because um, uh, the divine intellect um, because the ideas in my mind are among the conditions of other ideas, but are not all their conditions. Um, so the divine intellect has to contain the ideas that are that require my mind and other ideas, right? Because it contains all possible ideas. Um, it has the divine intellect has to have those ideas and affirm them under the right conditions. And therefore, my mind must have them and affirm them under the wrong conditions. <laughs> it's like one and the same will that that makes me affirm the falsehood and at the same time makes God affirm the truth. Um, or as I, I think I already said this last time, like the divine will not to be deceived is the very same thing as my will to um, um, make an unjustified judgment. And I mean, like, again, in a way, as Spinoza would say, this, this should be clear because uh, the intellect and will are, are one and the same, right? That is, the difference here is that I don't have all the acts of will that justify this act of will. Um, okay, so, I mean, so, but what this means is, like, so what do we have ideas of and are they adequate? Well, um, do we have an idea of our own body? Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one, right? You might think, well, my mind is the idea of this body. Of course I have it. But God says, God says, Spinoza says, <laughs> that's quite a slip. Um, <laughs> Spinoza says um, that, uh, well, hold on a second. This idea is in the divine intellect because of other ideas. This is a finite mode. Those other ideas are not in my mind. So my mind doesn't contain this idea at all. My mind only contains the ideas that follow from this idea. Right, so that's why he proves that, um, that we know that um, our own body only via the ideas of the affections of our body. Right, so we know our own body only by sensing it. And only by sensing it, um, sensing the way it's affected by other things outside of us. I mean, it's, I guess, not only things outside of us, because remember that also our body is composed of many parts. And the, uh, um, and the parts, uh, 
um, are not as such. That is like, here's a part, here's a small body that's in my body. At some later time, this small body can go out and another one can come in. Right? Like it happens every time I breathe, basically. Little, little bodies go out and other little bodies come in. Um, so, uh, so it's not this body or this body per se that's part of my um, body, but it's rather there has to be some body with a certain uh, type of motion relative to the others. So that means that in, a, that in effect, the, the particular individual bodies that are part of mine uh, are like outside of me. Right, they're not outside my skin, but they're outside the definition of my body. Um, so, so when things hit me from the inside or when the parts of my body like kind of start to show their own nature, Right when they start to do things because of the particular bodies they are, rather than because they're part of my body, both of those things are ways that I can be affected. And when I'm affected that way, that is when my body is affected that way, and my mind is also affected that that way. I have the idea of that affection of my body, um, and that's the only thing I know about my body. And moreover, Spinoza says, how do I know about my mind? Now, this part is confusing, but basically it's something like every idea, in addition to being an idea of its object, is also an idea of itself in a different way, right? So that's like, as I said, that part is confusing, but if you if you look like that's basically the way it works. Um, so, but it's an idea of itself because it's the exact same idea, in fact, he says it's 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 a difference of looking at it formally versus objectively, right? That distinction from Descartes again. I want to try to figure out exactly how that works, but the point is that um, so it turns out that also I know my own mind only via the ideas of the ideas of the affections of my body, which are really the same ideas looked at from a different way, right? So like this this in, this act of imagination. I want to call this the image, but he pretty he explicitly defines this as being the image. Right? So this act of imagination here is the idea, the fragmentary, confused, inadequate idea of an affection of my body. And it's also the fragmentary, confused, inadequate idea of itself as an idea in my mind. And this is the only way I know about my mind. Um, and of course, what I know about external bodies is the same, only worse, because um, the, because for sure, as long as my mind exists, my body actually exists. Like so, like I don't know that exactly. I mean, because I don't have the idea of my body itself in my mind. <laughs> um, but um, it's been, you know, this is something that's always confusing. I guess Spinoza says I do know my body exists, but the problem is like I don't necessarily know what it is that exists, right? So like it's similar to the situation of the meditator right after the cogito argument. And you want to say, well, how can you be sure you're not a figment in someone else's dream? And the answer is, well, if a figment in the other in someone else in someone's dream is the kind of thing that can carry out the cogito arguments, then fine. <laughs> That's what I just proved exists. Right later in the second meditation, and by the end of the sixth meditation, especially, Descartes, you know, tries to prove that I'm the, the you know, that uh, I have the kind of body I always thought I had, whatever, or sort of. Um, 
But like right after the Cogito argument, all I can say is something exists. <laughs> so like I think here, like, yeah, what I can say is whatever body is the body of this mind definitely exists because otherwise the mind wouldn't exist. <laughs> but I could be pretty wrong about it, as sometimes I am when I'm sleeping. Right? Like you could dream that you have wings or whatever. Go. Um, so, um, right, but as far as the external things go, sit because, and again, that's why this distinction, which I don't understand very well, is important. The effect is something which can't be conceived without its cause, but which continues to exist when its cause doesn't exist, or which can continue to exist when its cause doesn't exist. So this image can continue after the ball is gone. And unless there's some other ideas in my mind that rule out the existence of the ball, is the way Spinoza keeps describing it, then I, I still affirm that the ball is there. Um, so that is, my, my knowledge of external bodies is not even good enough to know whether they exist now or not. Something existed at some point that had an effect on my body, but it might not still exist. And yet my um, my indirect idea of it still exists, right? It's indirect because it's really an idea of a mode of my own body. It's a mode that, that to know what that mode is adequately, you would have to know about this other body, but I don't. Um, Right, so so imagination. So imagination is like, it's basically a bad kind of thought. It's a, it's a, I mean, that is, um, it's a kind of thought that the divine intellect doesn't have. Only finite intellects have imagination. And um, it's inherently inadequate, confused, fragmentary. It's responsible for our considering things as contingent, right? Like I think, well, this ball could have been there or not been there because I don't know the series of causes that made it necessary. Um, and it's also, as I said before, responsible for our thinking of things as interchangeable, as like it being a matter of indifference, whether there's a ball here or a ball there. Whereas actually, right, it's a matter of absolute necessity that there's a ball here or not there. <laughs> um, and also thinking that there's properties that things can share and have, you know, that this one has the property just as much as that one has because we can't tell the difference between them when we imagine them. So we imagine them as the same as each other when they're really not. Um, so like, it's starting to look bad in the sense of how could we have any adequate, right? Like what do we know? Um, So basically, and this is something that Spinoza doesn't explicitly say, but it's clearly he thinks it's true that um, infinite modes have consequences in a different way than finite modes do. Finite modes have consequences that exclude them from existence. I mean, maybe somehow that's the distinction here, that we call it an effect, or we, we think of it as a, but it doesn't, I mean, of course, this doesn't literally make it the case that the ball doesn't exist anymore, but I guess when this exists, the ball's hitting me, that stops existing. Right, so the, the, the direct, the event that was its cause ceases, and the, then there's the effect. I, I'm not sure if that's right, but in any case, the, the finite modes 
they exclude the things that follow from them. That's basically what finity is, right? It's like having a limit and I go this far and nothing else can be inside my limits. And then outside my limit, other things exclude me. Well, so, I mean, I think that, you know, I was drawing it like little bodies in the air there. And, and I think Spinoza thinks that is what happens, right? That's what this looks like in the mode of extension. But there's something analogous in the mode of thoughts where thoughts exclude each other. Um, so, um, so like, that's why when, when this thing causes something in my mind, um, I don't have the cause in my mind, even though I have the effect that involves the cause. Right? Uh, I, I don't have the cause. But in the case of an infinite mode, So here's an infinite mode of thought. Um, so the way Spinoza says is like it's in common to my to to well an infinite mode. It's in common to my mind and this mind. It's the same in the whole as in a part. Um, like I think what that means is that and this is like. Uh, again, getting close to, but not explicitly saying something from Hegel's logic, that right, Hegel says the true infinite is both itself and the finite, right? It doesn't exclude the finite. That would make, if it excluded the finite, it would have a limit and it would be finite, right? It doesn't stop at the edge of the finite. It keeps going through the finite. <laughs> um, and so uh, when, like both this idea in my mind and its cause and its cause and all its causes and everything are all consequences of the same infinite mode, um, then my mind both uh, involves this mode in the sense of following from it, but also contains it. Right, whereas here, my mind involves this finite mind in the sense of following from it, but it doesn't contain it because this excludes this. In the case of the infinite mode, um, it like whatever involves it also contains it. And um, what this means is that. Um, we can have adequate ideas of um, anything that is infinite and eternal. Um, so in particular, we have an adequate idea of the divine essence as expressed in thought and as expressed in extension. And every mind of an extended body has that. Um, but also, and I'm not sure what determines exactly which of these we have, but when we think about ge geometrical truths and truths of arithmetic, although how that works, I'm not sure either, um, but geometrical truths, um, we're thinking about these infinite modes. And therefore, in that case, we're using adequate and true ideas. And similarly, and this is going to be kind of a segue to the stuff that he talks about in book three, um, where, like he says at the very beginning, I propose to treat the passions just the way I would treat figures and lines and geometry. I think it's it's supposed to be literally the same thing, only in the mode of thought. Right? So we're thinking of, um, we're going to, so, you know, like, this doesn't help in terms of being right about my own body and what's happening to it. It might not be, <laughs> right? That's the condition of being a finite mind, I think, is, you know, 
uh, I mean, I can't be wrong that there are bodies, but in fact, that there are, that every possible body exists, right? That every pot, the truths of metaphysics, like every possible body exists, are, are all have to do with infinite modes, right? The nature of the divine essence and its expression through the attributes that I know it through. Um, um, but like, I can definitely be wrong about particular things. Does that mean I should suspend judgment and not believe in them? That's impossible. According to Spinoza, I will believe it, but I might be wrong. That's the way it goes. But <laughs> as far as the adequate ideas go, um, you know, I can know, like, in a, um, although putting it this way is immediately ambiguous. And again, it's an ambiguity that Hegel is going to work out, that Spinoza is like, doesn't work out explicitly. That, um, but, but anyway, what I was going to say is I can know them as instances of universal truths. Right? So, like, in other words, I can't know if there's really a sphere here, but I can know about spheres. Those truths are eternal. Right? That, like, a sphere, you know, that the volume is 4 pi r cubed or 3 or whatever it is. Um, right, like that's you know I can know that adequately. Um, similarly, I can know things about passions and emotions if um, if I stop thinking about them as particulars and start thinking about universal truths. Now, the reason I said it's ambiguous is because there's a kind of universal which is due to this confusion of the imagination. Right, and Spinoza says all the traditional ex examples, like dog, and I guess human being also, despite the fact that all this book is about human nature. When you look carefully, he doesn't really believe there is such a thing as human nature. <laughs> right, because human nature means that, like, when I think about humans in general, what's usually going on is not that I'm thinking about it, but that I that I know, but. Um, type of exact type of composite body I have in mind that I'm thinking about in universal terms. Rather, there's a whole bunch of different bodies that have all affected me, and their affections are all confused. And I've combined them into a kind of blurry picture. Um, and that is an inadequate idea that uh, doesn't correspond to anything. But the other kind of universal, <laughs> The kind by which you can understand the, the possibility and therefore the necessity of certain types of things, right? Like a un from the universal of triangle, if you know if you know the universal triangle, you know all the possibilities for triangles. And since everything possible is actual, right? Because everything, infinitely many things follow. From the divine essence, you know all the actual triangles as a consequence of the one universal. This is what Hegel calls a concrete universal. This is so that's the kind of universal knowledge we have when we think about infinite and eternal attributes and modes. Um, And it's the kind that everything in books three, four, and five is going to turn on the contrast between um, this kind of idea that our mind contains and those other adequate ideas that our mind contains. All right. Are there questions about that? I, you know, I mean, you know you're in trouble when in order to try to make something clearer, you start talking about Hegel's logic. <laughs> but, uh, I, I do think it makes it a little bit clearer, but I probably, you know, um, to, at least because he has terminology for this, like concrete universal. Um, but, 
Are there questions before I go on to talk about book three and book five? Okay. It's a bad sign. There's usually lots of questions in this class. <laughs> you finally said something that was so ridiculous that you don't even have a question. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, Right, so Spinoza starts book three with this thing about how my method is gonna be rather than abuse and deride the emotions, that is get emotional about them, right? <laughs> rather than get emotional about the emotions, I'm gonna try to understand them. And that's where the thing comes in about how I'm gonna use the method of geometry. Um, and basically that, that already is Spinoza's ethic. <laughs> right? I mean, it's going to turn out that that, that virtue consists of that. <laughs> um, or, you know, to use the Socratic slogan, which I'm sure, is, among other things, Spinoza has in mind, virtue is knowledge, right? Virtue is adequate ideas of yourself, especially. Know thyself, right? <laughs> um, Okay, but details. Well, I mean, so first of all, um, to understand where that comes from, you have to um, understand the definitions of active and passive. I think these are the most fundamental things for understanding the rest of the book. So at the beginning of book three, definition one, I think actually contains nothing new, really. Um, definition one, I call that an adequate cause whose effect can be clearly and distinctly perceived through the said cause. I call that an inadequate or partial cause whose effect cannot be understood through the said cause alone, right? The effect, can always and must always be understood through the cause. So the only thing that can go wrong is the, that it's only a partial cause, that the effect can't be fully understood through that cause, right? And that, again, is what's happening here. This effect can be understood through my mind, but not through my mind alone, also through this mind. Um, so that's the definition. So an adequate cause is, um, uh, the kind of cause that completely accounts for its effect, where its effect doesn't depend also on some other cause. And then, so based on that, we get definition two, which is the definition of active. I say that we are active when something takes place in us or externally to us, of which we are the adequate cause. On the other hand, I guess it's the definition of both active and passive. On the other hand, I say that we are passive when something takes place in us or follows from our nature, of which, of which we are only the partial cause. And then, um, that allows him to make definition three, the definition of emotion or affect. By emotion, I understand the affections of the body by which the body's power of activity is increased or diminished, assisted or checked, together with the ideas of these affections. Should I guess, I don't know, does that really depend on definition two? No, I guess, no, these are two, these are, these are two coordinate definitions because it turns out that this can be either active or passive. 
So here's the definition of motion. By emotion, I understand the affections of the body by which the body's power. Oh, I guess, yeah, okay. So it does depend on this. I'm getting confused. It depends on this because the definition. So an emotion, and this is the confusing thing about it. <laughs> so I might have confused myself. And the emotion itself can be active or passive. But what the emotion does is increase the, or decrease the activity of the body. Not everything that happens to my body increases its activity or increases or decreases its activity. So, I mean, like you can understand this and I think you're supposed to be able to understand it the way we usually do, right? So like um, if a feather bounces off my stomach, it doesn't affect the activity of my body. I don't, I don't lose any power. But if a huge heavy ball bounces off my stomach, then, ah, I lose power, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, um, so, and similarly, there's things that can happen to bo my body that increase its power, right? Like I, you know, eat something nutritious and it increases my power, right? So, um, um the when when my body is affected in a way that increases or decreases its power or activity the affection of my body together with the idea of it is called the emotion i mean it's weird in a sense there is no such thing as this together with this Right, like there can't be a composite made out of modes of different attributes. It can't be a whole whose parts are modes of different attributes. Especially if you take the the view that he um, gives in the scolium to Proposition Seven of Part Two, and you say actually these are the exact same things seen from two different points of view, right? Then you certainly can't take both of them together. <laughs> but so I, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly what he means by taking both of them together. I mean, it's important because also it would, you, it also would be, I guess, the same thing he means if you ask whether a human being can be considered as a mind plus a body. Again, in some sense, the answer is no, because there's no such thing as a mind plus a body. <laughs> um, but sometimes, at least, he seems to talk as if you can think of it that way. Anyway, so I don't know exactly what he means, except maybe that, like, when we talk about emotions, we go back and forth between thinking about what happens to the body and the idea of it. Um, so anyway, so the so the emotion is this transition it involves a transition from lower to higher or higher to lower activity and um and yeah so i said how you're supposed to be how we ordinarily understand that but i think but spinoza is saying so what that really means when the body's activity increases is that um, more effects depend more on that body and less on other bodies. Yeah. So activity is like self-control, right? Like emotion reduces your activity because it makes you more vulnerable to being influenced by other things. Well, some emotions increase your activity, right? Remember that the emotion let me read the definition again. By emotion, I understand the affections of the body by which the body's power of activity is increased or diminished, assisted or checked. Um, like disease? Well, so... Um, it includes or is most fundamentally pleasure and pain. 
Right. So okay. it's like so. So what happens when you have a disease? What did you say? So kind of insofar as the disease is pain, like. Yeah, I mean, so like the, the I mean, the feeling of the disease is, I mean, so so this, the disease actually is a disorder of those small parts that are not themselves part of the definition of your body. And therefore, their ideas are not themselves in your mind. But when they become disordered, the um, like that abstract uh, description that describes your body starts to describe something that's less powerful. It has, it's, it's. I think, I mean. Um, it's less adequately the cause of any effects. So, um, um, and that you have, so, and you have an idea of that change of your body. So you don't have, I mean, as we know, when you're sick, you don't know what's actually wrong. <laughs> Right, you don't have any. You don't have any idea of what's actually wrong, unless you're like you know take samples and look at them under a microscope or whatever. You have no idea what's going on. Um, but you do have an idea of the decrease of your body from more powerful to less powerful, and that idea, Spinoza says, is the pain. So the pain is the is is the feeling of the disease that's in my mind. Which is not an adequate, not at all an adequate idea of the disease. Yeah. So it'd be like, like let's say you get a really bad cold that like you know totally takes you out, and so you have to sit in bed for like a whole week and you can't do anything. Maybe you had plans to go out with someone at some point, but now you know you've got this cold, and it's just all ruined, right? You can't do anything anymore because you have to deal with this, and so it's like, I don't know. You, Right, there's like a, all of a sudden there's all these things that I could have done, but now I can't do. And I'm aware at least of that, you know. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that's complicated because it involves all kinds of other ideas, right? I mean, so like, I mean, I guess, so in addition to the pain, you know, that like you have a headache because of this cold. You also have pain because you like desire to get pleasure by going somewhere with your friend and now you won't be able to. That's not the same pain, although it's like it's a consequence of the first or something like that, right? I mean, it's because you have a headache, now you can't go out. <laughs> so so this pain leads to other pain. And and it's, you know, and it's like when we think of emotions, we're usually thinking, and Spinoza usually is interested in examples that are more like that, right? So like when you when you hate someone or something, you have pain together with associated with the idea of that person or thing. Um, but um, but like I think that pain is supposed to be the same as the kind of thing as the pain that you feel just when your head hurts because you're your uh, head is disordered or whatever costs that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe to bring up some other stupid examples, like the, the movie Vertigo, where, um, what's his name, James, uh, Jimmy Stewart, like he gets vertigo because he can't save some cop, and then like at some point he can't save the love of his life because of his vertigo, uh, and like he's wrapped with, with guilt and depression and he's totally ruined over that because I, something about the <laughs> vertigo, Making you worse, worse than you. There's like a, a sad feeling. Yeah, I mean, although I, again, I feel like like there's supposed to be a much more direct sense in which like something physically going wrong with your body is is like the, the direct idea of it is the pain that you feel, right? So, like again, what you're talking about here is, you know. 
guilt caused by memory, um, something that you think you could have done, but you actually couldn't, obviously, because you didn't, right? But, <laughs> but you thought you could have done because you imagine yourself doing it, even though you didn't. And, like, it's a whole complicated story. And again, I think it's supposed to be come down in the end to the same thing, right? Like, you, you know, you have an appetite for, you know, to be with people you love because they cause you pleasure and, and that like helps continue your body in existence. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's ultimately the same as the kind of, as the pain that you feel just the headache, but it's much more complicated to describe. I think. And, and I think like just to understand what pain is, um, um, and by the way, um, this is going to be the definition of pain and pleasure in Leibniz also, transition from more active to less active. Yeah. Um, so if I'm presuming we're considering active to be typically more beneficial, right? But how can we really know whether or not the emotional state that we are achieving is either more active or more passive if we have a finitude in how much we can like relate our emotional state to other concepts and other things that we don't know. Okay, I see what you're asking. Like, in other words, um, I think the answer is, so again, if, you know, if, if you think of the pain as caused by the fact that I'm literally not going to be able to make something happen, in the future, um, then it's true that that can be mistaken, right? So, you know, um, uh, because I don't know what affects my body is actually going to happen. Um, but I do know, and in a sense, it's the only thing I know, <laughs> like, uh, the only particular thing I know, I do know, like, or I don't know this, but I am the knowledge of what my body is, right? Like my mind is the knowledge of exactly what this composite body is. And so like my mind can't fail to know, so to speak, locally, whether it's increasing in activity or decreasing in activity. I mean, what, what I don't know is how other bodies are gonna interfere with it. Or how its parts are gonna interfere by going haywire, right? But, but what I do know at this moment is rather that whether this composite thing is becoming more suitable to cause adequate effects or less. Um, and, um, uh, I don't know that very well, right? Which is why sometimes I think the pain is here, but it's actually here. <laughs> you know, I only know it in an inadequate, confused way or whatever, but I definitely know it. Does that, I don't know, does that help? That does, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, well, like what you were saying before, adequate effects and in his definition of of active, uh, we are the adequate cause. What does it mean to be an adequate cause as opposed to, um, like, what does it say about passive? Um, partial cause. Yeah, partial cause. cause. Like, how does like something go from being a partial cause to an adequate cause? Like, where is the distinction? Well, so, okay, so of what affects is our mind the adequate cause? And the answer is, of whatever adequate ideas it contains, it's the adequate cause. Can we, but can't we not have adequate ideas because our, of our finite? Well, no, but remember, so that's why so it's important. Yeah. We don't have adequate ideas of particular things, mm -hmm. but we do have adequate ideas. Oh, okay. So like, and 
this is again what I said that this is all well, what Spinoza says at the beginning is already Spinoza's ethics in a sense. Mm. When we start thinking about our emotions in a, in a geometrical way, mm. rather than being emotional about them, and rather than caring whether it's my emotion or your emotion, right? We start thinking about all possible emotions, then we're becoming more active. Mm. Or at least then we are active when we do that, mm. right? So the mind is active in so far as um, it contains adequate ideas. Yeah. This that's I, I get you in a second. I just want to say one more thing. Um, in so in Spinoza, we get active is defined in terms of being an adequate cause of other things. And then it's proved with respect to our mind in particular that we're active when we have adequate ideas. Um, in Leibniz, it's going to turn out that our mind never causes anything outside itself. <laughs> and so um, um, having adequate ideas is going to turn into the, def the definition of active. <laughs> So it's like switched around. They still go together, but now like it's the only thing our my mind can cause is ideas, basically. <laughs> um, and it's active when it when it has adequate ideas. Yeah. It was just like kind of quick, but is if I have like an active emotion of pain, and then say I'm I work out, right? So I'm feeling pain. It's been more adequate to know that then it's like a pleasure that I'll like gain something further, like later down the line, right? You're like uh, forcing yourself into pain, but you're gaining something from it later. Yeah. Um, I guess kind of like the differentiation between pain and pain. Um, so I think. Um, so, you know, Spinoza says that your that every finite mode strives to continue in existence. Right? It has a conatus. This word is also going to turn up in lines. It has a conatus. It has like a Endeavor, I think, is how they translate it to stay in existence. Um, it's sometimes left untranslated in Spinoza and sometimes not. Yeah, but um, so, uh, and your mind similarly has, a, has this endeavors to stay in existence. Um, that is, I mean, is this a figurative way of saying um, the infinite divine power is in this I, in this idea itself is expressed just in that idea existing and not in it ever stopping. The stopping of it is expressed by the infinite divine power through other ideas. <laughs> Right, so uh, right, that, that is what excludes or limits it, is expressed by the infinite divine power by other ideas. So as far as you look at this one by itself, all you have is this power exerting to for it to exist. Now, like, why was I talking about that? Oh, because you were talking about, um, right, so um, therefore, uh, you always seek to increase your activity. Um, that is, you always seek pleasure. So if you're if you're working out whatever and it's hurting, it must be because there's some pleasure that now that outweighs that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, uh, because otherwise you wouldn't do it. You would stop. <laughs> um, and but in this case, the pleasure is the pleasure of anticipating how fit you're going to be or whatever. 
I was just reading this letter with Seneca talks about how stupid it is to work out and become fit. <laughs> Still to say. <laughs> what? He was a stoic, right? Yeah, he was a stoic. It's funny because I feel like a lot of people now who are into stoicism are very inspired to reach out. That's, pro that's probably true. I mean, he says you should exercise, but he says you should... You know, he says you should find the exercises that take the least time so that you can get quickly back to from the body to the mind. Yeah. So he says, like, just try jumping a little bit or whatever. <laughs> he, mentioned, he mentions that. He, he mentions the different kinds of, of jumping, like jumping to get high, jumping to get far, and then it's, I think it's like another type of jumping that's like this. <laughs> anyway, sorry. That's really irrelevant. Yeah. There's like a working out and doing these uh like curls or something it's like I, every time i do it i, I start to it like i come in every time i'm doing it like just whoa all right i didn't need to know that all right <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> yes <Good. laughs> best kind yeah so he defines emotions as affections of body which is on. Is it also an affection of the idea of the body, which is the mind? Well, remember, he says, it's along with the idea of that affection of the body. I mean, these two always go together. Right? Yeah. So, it, like, it doesn't matter that much. Okay. Um, so, now we actually have two equations, which might seem a little weird. Right, because on the one hand, we said knowledge is virtue. But on the other hand, we said knowledge is power. How can things, those things go together? Is it virtue or is it power? Well, Here's definition eight of part four. By virtue and power, I mean the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, and he's he's playing partly on the fact that the Latin word virtus, you know, um, uh, it's like used to translate uh, both the Greek word that means virtue, but also the Greek word that means force. <laughs> right? Like it's that is it's sometimes used to translate um, the Greek word dunamis should also be translated as force. Um, also can be translated as potency or anyway. So it's like Usually, you can tell what, from context which one they mean. But Spinoza is saying it's just one meaning. <laughs> there are two different meanings. <laughs> um, Right, so to be virtuous is to be powerful. That is, to have adequate ideas. Um, um, Right, and I just, like, before I go on, I wanted to, to just point out, again, this is something that got me confused, so I'm sure it'll get you confused. The, so the emotion is is the is a transition, or the idea of a transition from less active to more active, or vice versa, but the emotion itself can be active or passive, right? That is, the emotion is active when the transition to greater activity 
when when I'm the adequate cause of the transition to greater activity. And it's passive when something else causes the transition to greater activity. Um, and strictly speaking, when he defines pleasure and pain, um, this is in the scolium to proposition nine of part three, I guess, is what I meant. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the scolium to proposition 11. Yeah, let me read from the scolium to proposition 11. This is on page 111. We see then that the mind can undergo considerable changes and can pass now to a state of greater perfection, now to one of less perfection. And it is these passive transitions that explicate for us the emotions of pleasure and pain. So in what follows, I shall understand by pleasure the passive transition of the mind to a state of greater perfection, and by pain, the passive transition of the mind to a state of less perfection. Um, so, um, so pleasure and pain, let me, no, no, should I erase that picture? I'm probably gonna need that picture again. Parts of this are visible. Oh, lots of parts are visible on the screen. Over here. Mm -hmm. Over. Over here. All right. <laughs> so, I actually, I want to especially concentrate on pleasure. Pleasure is defined as a passive. Transition to a state. Of greater activity. So, given that definition, um, you can see that um, God has no pleasure. So, um, this is a corollary to Proposition 17 of Part 5. Um, strictly speaking, God does not love or hate anyone. For God, I guess actually Proposition 17 is God is without passive emotions and he is not affected with any emotion of pleasure or pain. That was actually what I wanted, but I'm going to read this one too. Strictly speaking, God does not love or hate anyone for God is not affected with any emotion of pleasure or pain. And consequently, by definition of emotions six and seven, he never, neither loves nor hates anyone. So if we went back to the definition of the emotions, by the way, this is a whole like genre definitions of the emotions. I think it actually starts with Aristotle and the rhetoric. But like all the early modern people have, you know, like Descartes has a long, in the Passions of the Soul, he has a long definition of all the emotions. Hobbes has a definition of emotions. Locke, right? So anyway, Spinoza has a long part of his definition of the emotions. And he defines love, as I said before, as pleasure associated with the idea of some external object. So, um, so uh, since God, there's nothing passive in God, number one, right? God is wholly active because God is the adequate cause of everything and the inadequate cause of nothing. Um, and there's no transition in God because God is eternal. <laughs> um, therefore, there's no pleasure in God. By the same argument, there's no pain in God, um, and therefore there's no love or hate, strictly speaking. Um, moreover, acting for an end is passive. So this is definition seven at the beginning of part four on page 156. 
By the end, for the sake of which we do something, I mean appetite. <laughs> right? That is, that when we do something for an end, that means we do it out of desire for something. Desire was defined, this was in the scolium to Proposition 9 of Part 3. When this conatus, when this conatus is related to the mind alone, it is called will. When it is related to the mind and body together, it is called appetite. Right, so this endeavor to remain in being is uh, um, is uh, explain why this is passive. Why is appetite passive? Well, okay. It's, yeah, it's the endeavor to remain in being, even though I'm not the adequate cause of myself always remaining in being. So it's always the desire for something I don't have, but need, right? Like that's what this panatus is throughout my existence. Um, because uh, um, although, you know, it's true that my mind doesn't contain the limiting point that will stop it, that has to be supplied by other ideas. It also um, doesn't contain any particular amount of duration at all. So it's dependent on other ideas to carry out this kind of this. Right? I'm not sure if that made sense. <laughs> um, but in any case, maybe. Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, this, I think I'm getting confused partly because I'm thinking ahead to Leibniz. In Leibniz, the conatus is going to be like the, um, a finite substance, like continually maintains itself in being without needing anything else. But for the same reason in Leibniz, a finite substance lasts forever unless it's annihilated by God, right? So it does, can like its idea of itself does contain infinite duration. But for this Spinoza's finite mode here, it, it doesn't contain any determinate duration at all. So the canadas to continue in existence, even for an instant, is always um, uh, um, is always an endeavor for something that I don't yet have but need to get. And so it's passive and it's not found in God. That was all a long way of saying, of, um, uh, trying to explain why God doesn't act for an end according to Spinoza. God doesn't act for an end because acting for an end is acting out of desire or appetite, and God doesn't have desire or appetite.
Now, by the way, I don't know, I shouldn't talk about this because there's only five minutes left. And I need to talk about some, some other even more important things. Should talk about the definition of good. No, I'm going to talk about, so, um, so like, so this is the picture we have so far. Um, God doesn't feel pleasure. God doesn't love anyone. Um, um, everyone desires pleasure for themselves. Um, everyone desires to uh, continue an existence indefinitely, but no one will continue an existence indefinitely. <laughs> and um, the mind exists exactly where the body exists. Um, and everyone, insofar as they feel pleasure, is they're always being acted on by other things and making a transition from less perfect to more perfect. Um, uh, okay, but now you can relax the definition of pleasure. And this is the, this is one of the tricks. So basically, at the end of, set of book five, or part five, there's a series of tricks by which he enables himself to say all kinds of traditional sounding things, even though he's just proved the opposite of them. And the most, Ray, the most important trick is that um, he uh, redefines pleasure in such a way that um, a continuous state of activity can, now counts as pleasure. So it doesn't have to be passive and it doesn't have to be a transition. And now all of a sudden we can say, God takes pleasure. <laughs> Um, um, God necessarily always is in a high state of pleasure, an infinite state of pleasure. Right before we said God doesn't take pleasure at all. Now we say God is always necessarily in an infinite state of pleasure. And um, therefore God loves everything necessarily. <laughs> Every idea in the divine intellect is associated with infinite pleasure. Um, now, as far as the like virtue and the, um, and I guess, you know, we should also say, so like, what makes one person more virtuous than another? Um, I'm trying to go fast and some things out of order. Okay, now let me talk. Oh, I'm out of time anyway. I'll just say, okay, so what he ends up saying is number one, there's a sense in which the mind is eternal. What is the sense in which the mind is eternal? Well, the sense in which it follows eternally by necessity from the divine nature. Um, and um, like what's essential to it in that sense is the adequate ideas that it contains. So the mind eternally by this new definition of pleasure has pleasure 
depending on how virtuous it is. So it sounds like, oh, you should be virtuous in this life so you'll be eternally have pleasure. But it actually means um, like, depending on what the eternal essence of your mind is, you'll have more or less pleasure <laughs> in this life and you'll eternally have quote unquote pleasure which just by definition. Moreover, by the same trick, the body is exactly as immortal as the mind, but he doesn't say that, right? It also follows eternally, <laughs> right? So, um, and that's number one. And number two, he also adopts a mode of speaking where he starts talking about um, a human being insofar as they are wise or insofar as they have only adequate ideas. Now, no one can have only adequate ideas, right? We just, we, we saw here that, that, that the mind consists basically of a whole bunch of inadequate ideas of the body, right? Plus a few adequate ideas. Um, but Spinoza starts talking as if there could be someone who had only adequate ideas. That's like the sage, like the stoic sage. Um, and that enables him to say things like, the, you know, the virtuous person is free or something like that, right? That is, insofar as someone is virtuous, that is powerful, therefore, that is adequately expresses the divine essence, they're free because the divine essence is infinite free power. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm over time and that's not a very adequate, so to speak, explanation, <laughs> but that will have to do. Um, I guess, I mean, one thing it can show is like, again, coming back to why someone would look at this book and say, it has all these pious sounding things in it, but it's atheism. And why Leibniz in particular is of importance to us, why Leibniz is gonna say, this has to be fixed. I can't let this system stay this way. We have to figure out how to fix it. Right. So,